Part of Housing for All, the government's plan for housing to 2030, was a commitment to review and streamline planning legislation. After a 15 month review led by the Office of the Attorney General, the draft planning and development bill was published. That was at the end of January of this year, 2023. It's a big piece of legislation, 738 pages long. It was referred to the Joint Committee on Housing, Local Government and Heritage by the Minister for pre-legislative scrutiny. Over a series of nine meetings, the committee heard many considered presentations from departmental officials and 20 other bodies and organizations operating in the planning field. The Joint Committee considered all the inputs, they compiled a report, and this, together with a significant string of recommendations, was issued in April. So that now is being considered by the department. Me, I'm an independent councillor with Cork County Council. I live in Passage West on the shores of Cork Harbour. Oliver asked me to chair this session, I think because I have a particular interest in and concerns about the draft bill. In February of this year, I proposed a motion in our council chamber asking that our 55 members would let government know how concerned we as a body were that the bill as drafted would miss taking the opportunity to make sure that Ireland meets the requirements of the Irish Convention. We've already been found to be in breach of our legal, legally binding obligations under Aarhus. And the bill is an unparalleled opportunity to get that right. As I see it though, as currently drafted, the bill would further limit democratic input, public participation and access to justice. Um, so Oliver's given me permission to have a minor rant. It will be minor, in fact, even before we came on, I started deleting my rant because my, my, my difficulties with this bill are significant. But just to go to the core of some of the fundamentals, from the perspective of somebody, um, take the councillor piece out of it, who's been a resident of Cork Harbour all their lives. One of the big issues, which I haven't heard mentioned by anybody, is that the Planning and Development Bill perpetuates the Strategic Infrastructure Development Act, which the Iraq has passed in 2006. The aim of it was to fast track infrastructural projects deemed of national importance. This act is one of the most undemocratic pieces of legislation I have ever seen. It enables developers with big infrastructural proposals to bring them directly to onboard Panola, bypassing local representatives of the communities in which the projects would be situated, a bit like the SHDs. The developer enters into pre-application consultations with the board. During those, the board identifies matters it wishes the planning application to address. Sometimes that consultation can last for several years, and in that period, the receiving community knows nothing about it. The developer then engages a wide range of experts to help prepare the planning application. When it's finally opened to consultation, the community has six weeks to read and understand sometimes thousands of pages, and I mean thousands, of technically complex and specialised information. Oral hearings are often called because of the magnitude of the projects. The developer will present with a team of legal and technical technical experts of similar expertise, and then to level the playing field, the community has to try to find available and affordable experts of a similar calibre in sufficient time to enable those experts review the information. Attendance at an oral hearing means taking time from work and family, preparing long for the, night, for the following day, sometimes for periods of up to three weeks. The only one not paid at an oral hearing is the community. In fact, it costs them dearly. They sacrifice their day job, they engage additional childcare, they fundraise for months long after the oral hearing is over. And the Planning and Development Bill proposes to perpetuate this extraordinary inequity. I've been a member of Chase, the Cork Harbour Alliance for a Safe Environment for 20 years. We've successfully opposed three repeated planning applications for the same incinerator development in Cork Harbour. Each time, the onboard Planola inspector recommended refus refusal of the application. Each time, the board overturned the inspector's recommendation. So the Planning and Development Bill is silent, both on how many times a community must bear the burden of repeat applications as a developer tries to beat a community down. It's silent on how the board can legitimately overturn the recommendations of its inspectors, all of whom are individuals qualified in planning and who have waded through masses of material before delivered, delivering a considered and justified opinion. It's silent on the phrase that I'm so sick of seeing in decisions issued by the board. The board has completed an appropriate assessment of the case. The board never completes an appropriate assessment. It relies on information submitted by the consultant engaged by the applicant. The board members have neither the expertise nor the independent data that would enable them to carry out an appropriate assessment. But in its silence, the bill perpetuates this fallacy. 
After each decision was issued by the board, Chase ended up in the High Court. Twice we initiated proceedings, once proceedings were initiated by the developer. The only redress to a decision on any planning application that goes directly to the board is judicial review. The Chase experience is that judicial review can cost up to €200,000. Under the current system, you're not liable for the other side's costs if you lose, but you can be awarded some of your costs if you're successful. Identifying and engaging a legal team on the Never Never who can be adequately prepared within the specified eight week time frame is a huge challenge. In 2021, about 3% of the board's decisions were subject to judicial review. Of those, about 91% were vindicated by the High Court. Or in other words, in 91% of challenged decisions, the board was found to have legally erred in its decision making. So you'd imagine the aim of this bill would be to improve the quality of decision making and ease access to the courts, but no, it seems to do the opposite. The bill proposes time limits on decision making, meaning some decisions, especially more complicated strategic infrastructural ones, could risk being rushed. Properly considered decisions on major developments with potentially generational impacts should take years, not weeks. Moreover, if a decision is challenged by judicial review, the bill further encourages poor decision making with a nonsensical proposal to allow the decision maker to pause court process, correct its error in law and amend its decision. And that's after the community has raised 200,000 euros. There's a fine balance to be struck in making access to judicial review possible, but fair. The draft bill makes no attempt, in my opinion, to find this balance. It proposes a new aid scheme for costs determined not by the independent judiciary as it is at present, but by the minister or a representative of the minister, leaving determination of costs awarded to a community group subject to political control and government interests. It proposes a new and vastly restrictive definition of who may take a judicial review. Suffice to say that under the bill's proposed definition, Chase, my community group, which has successfully defended three planning applications for iterations of the same incinerator development over two decades, winning twice in the High Court, would probably not qualify as ed eligible to request a judicial review. So these are a taste of my, my most fundamental concerns, and they are obviously my own, only my opinions. So we're honoured to have with us this evening three speakers who will increase our understanding of what the bill includes and um, what hope there is of amending its deficits. Our first speaker, Atrakti Ibrin, is the Irish Environmental Network's Environmental Law Officer. She also acts as the facilitator for the Environmental Law Implementation Group. That's a joint initiative with the government to support proper transposition and implementation of environmental law. And then we will hear from our spe second speaker, Fred Logue. Fred is a managing partner of FP Logue Solicitors, and he specializes in environmental technology, intellectual property, information law, and commercial law. And like me, he began life as an engineer. Both Attracta and Fred presented to the Joint Committee on Housing, Local Government and Heritage in relation to this bill in March. I and some other members of Chase travelled to Dublin to support them and were very grateful for the comprehensive discussion they had with the members of that committee on that day. So our third speaker is Stephen Matthews. I don't know if Stephen has joined us now, but I know he's going to be hopping in and out the best he can because there are voting, this voting has been taken in the Doyle at this time. Stephen is a Green Party TD from Wicklow. He is the Green Party spokesperson on planning and local government, and he has the either enviable or unenviable, depending on your position, your opinion, position of being the chairperson of the Joint Committee on Housing, Local Government and Heritage. So, Attracta, we'd be very grateful to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marcia. And that, that was uh, a very hard act to follow in terms of rant, but I certainly will do my best, but it was quite a masterclass. So thank you very much for that. I'm, I'm considering moving to Cork to vote for you. Um, I'm going to try and share a screen uh, if uh, I can. Um, I was, I'm inclined to make a mess of this. But, uh, can you see that screen now? Not yet me anyway. Can you see that now? No. Okay, sorry, I won't delay people long on this. Oh, you're time. fine, take your time.
yeah you're having success okay that's great mm. okay can you see that in full screen mode now uh we can see the presentation it's presentation mode we can see the yes yeah. okay. slides on the left but it's fine that's brilliant thank you thank you very much um uh, and thank you for that introduction uh uh, Marcia, um, I am the Environmental Officer of the Irish Environmental Network. I'm speaking in a personal capacity because I probably will go into rant mode myself this evening. Um, I've been after hours, but uh, many of the concerns that I would have raised or I will raise tonight would be those of, of my colleagues and would have been outlined in our presentations before the Oireachtas Committee and in various submissions around this uh, particular planning bill. Um, so I would just like to type thank the organisers for this opportunity uh, and say how important I think it is that we continue the debate and dialogue and, and scrutiny of this bill, albeit the formal scrutiny process has finished. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Irish Environmental Network, just by way of context, it's the coalition of national NGOs in Ireland. That slide of images of our members isn't fully up to date, but there'll be a number of names that ho hopefully many of you will, will recognise. Um, um, so what I wanted to do just very, very quickly is um, just because I'm conscious that we may have a mixed audience and particularly people listening back to this is just to focus on why planning and planning legislation is so important. Uh, what's so significant about this particular planning bill, because there always seems to be some planning bill uh, that somebody on Twitter is giving out about or promoting one way or the other. Um, what's happened so far and what's next? Marcy has already covered a lot of that, so I can glance over that. Key areas of concern, particularly for um, my colleagues um, and uh, myself, and some core recommendations reflecting on what uh, we would have presented at the Joint Oireachtas Committee. Director, hang on. What slide number are you on there? Because we're still on one. Okay, um, I'm on slide three. Super, now we can see three. Thank you. Okay, so. Um, so why is planning and planning legislation so important? Well, from mo as most of you will appreciate, but for those of you, um, I think it's it's who do, it's important really to re-emphasize this to people that think planning is for nerds who squint at site notices. Uh, I think it's really important that everybody understands how important planning is just to the practical reality of their everyday experience in the world. Uh, from the moment that you set the clock at night wondering whether you've set it early enough to jump the traffic, you know, and to get into town and to get the kids sorted and everything, you know, whatever journey you have to travel to school, etc. To whether you actually fall out of bed on a couch or from a comfortable bed in your own home or a couch in your parents or whether you're facing eviction as so many are, are already homeless as so many people in this country already are. To when you turn on the taps and wonder whether you actually have to boil the water in order to be able to brush your teeth, to the congestion and the air quality issues and the safety issues that you face on our roads, to your participation in really key pieces of um, fundamental planning around county development plans, um, a key piece of, of the, the architecture and how we actually manage the communities and the economies and the environment that we all live in, um, to the critical transition that we need in terms of our energy transition, and the advance of things like offshore renewable energy. Um, but to do that safely and to do that in a way which is both compliant with the law and which is also um, recognises the interdependent nature of the climate and biodiversity crisis, which has been highlighted by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and to fulfil our obligations, our, our legal obligations, in terms of protection and conservation of species. So planning legislation helps and guides us through all of this, or at least that's what it's supposed to do. Um, the um, uh, other thing that our planning legislation does, and what is critically sometimes often overlooked, is that it is an incredibly important vehicle for how we actually implement our EU law obligations. And EU law isn't all about red tape and uh, uh, administrative burdens, etc. It's key to cr critical things like quality, standards of living, air quality issues, bathing water issues, all sorts of things that we now take for granted after a number of decades within the EU. But there are a number of critical EU directives that are implemented through our planning legislation and also international conventions like the Aarhus Convention, which I'll talk about a bit more later, and also the ESPU Convention, which is critically important for a country like Ireland, an island nation in terms of the transboundary impacts of, of, of other um, 
uh, developments in, in other countries uh, on us. So what's so significant about this particular bill? Um, as Marcy has outlined, it's part of the Housing for All strategy that there was a review by the Attorney General. But I would just flag that there is no review. There's just an output, which is this draft bill. We have had no proper critical assessment of what works well and what doesn't work well within the current planning system, let alone the legislation. Uh, we've just got published this, this, this output. Uh, it's intended to actually replace in its entirety the current Planning and Development Act 2000. So this isn't a tweak. This is a major rewrite. Um, it changes some 582 pages to 738, which is actually incomplete and we're expecting more to be added to it. As Marcy said, it's been published in January 26th, but being published as a draft bill, it has skipped the critical stage of being a heads of bill, where you have an explanatory memorandum associated with each part of the bill in explaining what it's supposed to be doing, what's changed, etc. And that has been omitted from this bill. So much so that one of the the uh, witnesses, um, it was Gavin from the Irish Planning Institute, likened it to a game of spot the ball when you were going through the bill. Uh, for those of you old enough to remember that game in, in the, uh, the papers where you used to have to try and figure out where the ball was, it's a bit like that, trying to figure out what's changed, what hasn't and, and why, uh, which is obviously the critical um, uh, thing. It will drive a major rework of associated regulations, which is currently, you know, 625 pages, and we don't really have any detail on that at all. Uh, the pre-legislative scrutiny, which Marcy referred to, commenced shortly after publication. To put that in context, we had 27 hours of oral hearing on a bill whose contents alone run to 28 pages. And the report has that was issued following the scrutiny. Uh, and I would like to commend the, the members of the committee for, for, for their efforts in, re, in respect of the scrutiny, has an unprecedented 153 recommendations, which is a big, hello, there are problems here. There is stuff, there is work to be done. And increasingly, um, as we have seen in comments from an extraordinary coalition of, of voices from people within the construction industry, with the property industry, the Irish Planning Institute, um, the, the legal profession, both houses basically from the bar and from the solicitors uh, in the Law Society, uh, all expressing concern together with members of, of, of ENGOs and civil society. Two key areas um, adding to Marcy's concerns, and I think just looking at maybe at a bit of a higher level, is how it, at how it attacks local democracy. There's major centralization of control and planning given to the minister and government without any adequate safeguards, okay? Um, the other major attack within the bill is in respect of environmental democracy. It includes deeply controversial changes to the rules and judicial review. And while this isn't the planning bill, it is really important to realize that this impacts across all sectors, uh, certain of the changes that is. Um, so when I talk about judicial review, and it's the one I'm going to zoom in on, uh, uh, just in the interest of time, Judicial review is a mechanism by which an application can be made to the High Court to challenge the decision making processes of administrative bodies and the lower courts. That's a definition that's on on our courts website. It's basically checking the legality of the decisions that have been made by our public bodies. So it's a fundamental element of the architecture of the rule of law. It's a fundamental part of our democracy in terms of how we know that there isn't arbitrary, ex, you know, uh, abuse and use of power. It's a, the integral balancing act in a democracy where the power that we cede to government is held in check and to account by our ability to hold them to account before the courts. And even if you think you will never go to court in your wildest dreams, you all know that it is really important that the public authorities know that somebody can and could hold them to account before our judiciary. So the rules on how to pursue a judicial review are set out in our Planning Act. And as I said, some of these apply beyond the Planning Act, um, and I'll touch on that. But in terms of judicial review and, and all of that sort of concept in terms of accountability, it's important to realise that access to justice in terms of the right to go to court, the knowledge, the information, the ability to do it, and for that to be meaningful, 
um, derives from a number of different things. It's not just something associated with Aarhus, which it's typically discussed in relation to, but it arises from things like the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, the EU treaties, our constitution, and of course the Aarhus Convention. Aarhus is particularly important because it goes that extra mile in terms of it has special definitions and special rules for the rules on, on review and what is, you know, who and what can be reviewed uh, under the convention. And it has characteristics to make that right of access to justice meaningful and practical. So it's one thing to be told you can go to court, but if you're worried about losing your shirt or literally the roof over your head, well then it's, it's very little good to have that right. So our house requires that basically there are core characteristics um, uh, provided by state parties who have ratified the Arhus Convention to provide adequate and effective remedies, including injunctive relief, and to be fair, equitable, and not prohibitively expensive. There's also special rights for ENGOs um, because it recognises that the fish can't go to court and the ENGOs are effectively the voice for the environment. Um, the way our house impacts upon Irish legislation is actually a little bit complex because it comes to us through EU law because the EU has ratified the Aarhus Convention um, and it is an integral part of the EU le legal order but Ireland also has direct obligations because we're a party to a convention in our own right but we don't have carte blanche basically we have to consider interpretations and clarifications from the Court of Justice on how they have interpreted the obligations and also findings of the Aarhus Convention Compliance Committee. And that's when we basically apply rules of standing, costs, scope of review, you know, and timeliness and inadequacy of remedies. Um, so for Ireland, when we came to ratify, one of the biggest issues we had was how the hell are we going to deal with that issue of not prohibitively expensive, to put it very bluntly, because everybody is aware of how expensive litigation is in Ireland. So the challenge was costs follow the event, loser pays is the normal position. If you, if you lose your argument, not only do you have to pay potentially the state party that you've challenged, but also the developer who may have been a notice party to the proceedings because they're impacted. Um, so not pro prohibitively expensive was a key challenge for Ireland. And in 2010, the Greens and the Fianna Fáil coalition brought in a deeply problematic change to the rules, um, which said that each side bears its own costs which effectively meant even if you won, you basically still had the burden of actually meeting the costs of your own legal team. Uh, and this was hugely problematic. We highlighted it would be effectively make environmental litigation unsustainable because you would be endlessly relying as ENGOs who had no adequate funds to pay for litigation on pro bono uh, lawyers who, who you know, may do one or two cases, but then invariably they have their own mortgages um, to, to um, to pay, so they would have to um, basically say no, regardless of, of, of how they wanted to support you. So thankfully, the rules were modified in 2011 when Phil Hogan uh, of Fine Gael was Minister for the Environment. And I would say I have no party political affiliations or memberships. I'm just saying the facts as they are. And he did this as part of the effort to ratify um, and the changes needed to ratify the Aarhus Convention. What was critically important about this was it allowed for a rule called one way cost shifting. So you could, if you were successful in some of your arguments and your reliefs, basically, um, you could recover some of your costs. That meant that you had some effectively money to pay your, your legal fees for those of you who didn't have deep enough pockets to do so. It allows for no full, no fee engagement where lawyers were prepared to engage on that type of model and basis that if you were successful, they would get paid and they would take the risk on what they considered to be a good case. That had the added advantage that it screened out effectively on meritorious cases. So the JR changes in part nine of this proposed bill are, in my view, an unprecedented regression on our house human rights. And they are human rights, I might add. It is a human rights convention, not an environmental convention, uh, implemented in Ireland just over a decade ago. It currently changes five pages in the Planning Act to go to 10 pages. That gives you some sort of scale of the additional level of detail and, and provisions therein. And that, that's even incomplete. And the changes are right across the board from the leave process, standing scope of review, adequacy of remedies, cost rules, and the business of the, of the court and how it orders it. To put it in context of where we were at, when Phil Hogan made those changes, everything didn't go swimmingly. Uh, there was clarifications, there was queries, there was what we call satellite litigation. 
where in order to clarify the scope of the cost rules, effectively there was little spin-off cases actually trying to understand, you know, the nature of that. And in that greyness, effectively, I always joke that grey is a lawyer's favourite colour, there was extensive litigation. In fact, in November, in an incredibly important judgment from our Supreme Court, which brought to an end uh, some lack of clarity on um, the cost rules, um, the very opening paragraph reflected on the scale of, and I, I leave you there to reflect on it just in the interest of times, but over 35 reserved judgments of the High Court, four decisions of the Court of Appeal, three references to the Court of Justice of the European Union, one judgment of that court, and now this decision of court. And that was just on the non-prohibitively expensive requirement. Do the maths. We're now talking about changes right across the board, scope, standing, remedies, everything. And that was just on the scope of review, or, or the, the non-prohibitively expensive costs. We've heard from the legal profession, um, basically that once you introduce changes, you invariably introduce the potential for further argument and that will drive, and interpretation, that will drive what we know as satellite litigation, which will delay the resolution of cases. And people will fight for their right to be heard in the courts. They've talked about years of delay. And so these JR changes are directly contrary to the purported objectives of the review, which were around certainty, streamlining and clarity. That risk and uncertainty and delay is going to mean a direct impact on the provision of homes and the much needed climate action projects in transport and energy. And where the green agenda fails at the cabinet table, the ability to uphold environmental law throughout the courts is key. So we can't lose sight of the issues with standing and scope of review and remedies in the proposed changes. But particularly on costs, we have a draft head and the details of it are unclear. The basic principles outlined, I would have to say, are entirely unacceptable. It leaves the control of access to justice subject to political control and the vagaries of the exchequer. Um, if we can't get civil legal aid right for our children, what hope for the environment? And that's the practical reality. We have an appalling system of civil legal aid. No disrespect to the judges, the legal profession and the many uh, NGOs and, and people involved in that. But it, it, it reflects really poorly on our society. It displaces the cost from, by displacing the cost from the authorities responsible, it is not consistent with standards of environmental decision making. It proposes some legal aid scheme, it doesn't specify what it's going to be or how it's going to work. So it will either be so generous, it risks bankrupting the state and, and precipitating frivolous lawsuits by unscrupulous persons who may seek to, to exploit the generosity of the system, or it will be so restrictive it will cause delays and burden the courts and impact upon the rights of the public and ENGOs in protecting the environment. The delays and the issues will also undermine confidence in investing in Ireland, including in things important areas like offshore renewable energy. What is particularly egregious is the false and toxic narrative on, on judicial review that has been used to accompany these changes. And again, I'm conscious of time, so I'll just leave you to reflect on that. But these aren't just my words or my facts or my figures. The Office of the Planning Regulator, um, or the, the regulator, um, the planning regulator, and uh, Neil Cousins said on the record in the PLS um, that basically the vast majority of decisions go through with very, very little um, degree of drama. The just 3% of onboard planolis decisions in 2021 were subject to GJR, and that's just 0.25% of all planning decisions. There's no evidence base for these changes, and we need to provide an evidence base to justify the proportionality of response impinging on rights to judicial recourse. There was a spike in judicial review, but it was associated with very, very defective legislation, uh, the strategic housing uh, development provisions. Um, and the facts on that speak for themselves. And I'm sure Fred will talk more about that, so I'll leave that to him. But even from a practical common sense point of view, there couldn't be a worse time to mess with access to the, board, the, the courts. If you're just taking a step back and you're thinking about this from a pure systems change point of view, with the best will in the world, even if we were to give all the time to this piece of legislation, which is unlikely, errors will be made in it. The track record of administration and passage of legislation on this quality of this government has been very poor. The probability of new and unfamiliar legislation with imperfections is, is, is very high. 
Add to that the fact that you have woefully under-resourced public authorities, in, particularly in the area of planning. Uh, some 541 deficit was noted in the PLS uh, in terms of uh, local authorities planning functions. Uh, and we also have issues within the resourcing of the board. So you've got a huge probability of flawed decisions arriving given the new and unfamiliarity and overstretch of the legislation and overstretched resources. The courts are the great clearinghouse for solving all of those problems. So if you've made errors, you want to be able to get in and out of them very quickly. So there couldn't be a worse time to do this. I'm going to skip over that just in the interest of time, but I would just flag that before Christmas, the independence of the board was severely compromised with legislation. And now after Christmas, they're uh, was proposing to restrict our ability to hold it to account. So the key recommendations I would have, and, and these were the ones that we made in before the Joint Iraq this Committee, is to delete part nine, the changes in judicial review, maintain the status quo. Um, and I would highlight two very critically important, uh, and they might seem mundane recommendations of the committee, which is that adequate time needs to be provided for the final drafting of the bill and its passage through the Oireachtas. This cannot be railroaded, as we have seen with so much planning legislation and indeed other environmental legislation by this government. And there should be a proper rationale and a justification for the, the changes proposed, and there should be proper consultation on what's proposed. There's further detail there on the rule of law, but ultimately, that's my core message. Um, that's what we see in this bill, and that's the concern. Expect delays. This will not speed housing. This will not speed critical climate infrastructure. Thank you. In fact, that was fantastic. Thanks so much. What an amazing overview. And thanks for your deep dive into judicial review because um, you explained it in a way that even I, who've been through it three times, didn't understand. And I loved your 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 look at planning overall and how fundamental it is to our everyday living. And um, that's fantastic, and it's it's so true. Um, I'm going to move on to Fred, if that's okay. Um, Fred, if you're ready. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, good evening, everybody, um, and uh, Marcia. And I decided to thank Oliver and the Just Transition Greens organization for the invitation to speak at this event this evening, and also to other attendees for taking the time out of their schedule and their spare time to have this conversation about an issue which is fundamental uh, to our society, and in particular, to how we deal with the climate and biodiversity crises. So the Planning and Development Bill, as you've heard from Attracta, proposes wide ranging changes to the planning system to the planning procedure generally, and in particular, very significant limitations on access to justice, which are contrary to the Aarhus Convention, in, in my opinion. Um, uh, it also misses the opportunity to bring Ireland's regime uh, uh, into compliance with the Aarhus Convention on a number of other fronts, including access to inf our environmental information and in public participation. Uh, and it also misses the opportunity to remove barriers to public participation, including participation fees and, uh, uh, and other aspects, which I'll describe in a little bit more detail. Um, but before I begin, um, I'd just like to discuss the background to our planning system. Um, and what, what, like, what it's, what's it about? Why do we have planning? That's, that's the fundamental question. So. The statutory objective of the Planning Act is to provide, to deliver proper planning and sustainable development. And that's via essentially a system of plans and uh, permitting procedures, so planning permission. <clears throat> and, you know, the question is, what is proper planning? Uh, and, you know, it's, it's a kind of a, a, you know it when you see it type of question. But it's, it's, I think it's very much about the big picture stuff uh, rather than the technical details, which it often kind of boils down to. Uh, and it's intended that planning authorities will set a high standard of development in their areas, firstly through the development plan, and then secondly through granting planning permission, which comply with the concept of proper planning. Uh, and then the second aspect is, um, <clears throat> and people can make up their own minds about whether that's been achieved, but in my view, there's way too much focus on the quantity uh, at the expense of quality of development. So the, the, the conversation is about numbers of houses rather than whether we're delivering the right type of house in the right place with the right tenure at the right price, uh, that'll be future proofed. So we can build 100,000 houses a year in Donegal and then we'll have meet, met our targets, but it's not much good to the people who have to live elsewhere in the country. 
so this idea of numbers is just a, a very 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 blunt measurement and it doesn't really capture what's needed from the housing system um so sustainable development then is more of an international concept and it's it's concerned with striking a balance between economic social and environmental concerns when granting planning permission or de devising plans and then underneath all of that there's a layer of kind of mandatory environmental limits that are defined in legislation mostly from eu law so they, they include the habitats directive and the water framework directive uh, and other other directives <laughs> aimed at uh, protecting the environment so then kind of procedurally there's a framework that's set by what's called the Aarhus convention and that provides a pr procedural framework uh, which involves uh, rights of access to information uh, rights to participate in decision making that are likely to affect the environment significantly and then access to justice in relation to uh, environmental issues uh, and then so these concepts have their origins in the environmental democracy movement from the 1970s and they've kind of filtered down through kind of UN kind of declarations very high level documents uh, then into the Aarhus Convention 1998 and then into EU law and into into <coughs> Irish law eventually but I think the kind of the takeaway from it all is that the planning system is a, is a rights-based framework uh, and so it gives individuals rights which are aimed at protecting the environment they're aimed at delivering sustainable development and they're aimed at providing proper planning because if people don't have those rights then money and power will take over and we'll end up with an undemocratic system where the powerful or the rich will get what they want rather than society benefiting overall and it's, it's important not to lose sight of that so uh, attracted just talked a little bit about the vague origins of the bill and you know i put up a heading in my notes here about origins of the bill but it's not really clear where it came from because it was it was a lot of it was done in secret um a lot of it has been done based on kind of prejudices that there's too much delay there's too much this there's too much that but a lot of it's just develop developer lobbying uh and there's no real analysis or objective analysis to to base the the changes on in fact we don't even really know what all the changes are because the the drafters of the bill haven't provided a kind of com a comparison between the existing legislation and the proposed legislation so it's all it's all a bit of a shot in the dark really at the moment uh, so as attractor said we skipped the heads of bill stage there's no published analysis that i know of about what problem the bill is actually solving uh, there's some the scraps of knowledge in the public domain mostly from the planning regulator which point to the issues not being due to the planning system really or the judicial system but elsewhere uh, but, but we're still soldiering on because we've committed to this reform uh, without really defining what where, what the end target is <clears throat> uh, so but you know when you read the bill you can tell that the the, mi the mindset of the drafter was pro de pro development there's kind of subtle biases in the bill which you can see are favoring developers over the public um you know so it's not my view it's not a balanced piece of legislation by any any stretch of the imagination so I, I just go and talk about the kind of three pillars or the three themes for environmental democracy uh, in the context of the bill so access to information is the primary right you can't participate in a planning uh, uh, decision if that you don't know about or that you don't know the details of so it's, it's remarkable actually that uh, in Ireland you, you only get access to the planning file at some arbitrary time within in, in the period in which you're allowed to make comments which is only five weeks so um, you, you don't even have to be told about it for about two weeks for, formally told about it through a kind of what's called the weekly list uh, you, the information doesn't have to be put online until the application is is validated but the time starts ticking or the clock starts ticking before the decision is validated uh, and all, all of this is completely contrary to the Irish convention uh, and uh, the opportunity i think has been missed to firstly go to an, a completely electronic system so anyone who's dealt with on board panola will realize that they're steadfastly wedded to the 1970s in that they just don't accept the internet exists uh, you have to go to Dublin to see their paper files. So even if you live in Cork, imagine if you live in West Cork, it's a it's a long old haul up from the Bera Peninsula or 
you know, points west, even to get to Cork City. But to get to Dublin, it's a shocking trip. And the board, if you want to get an electronic copy of their file, will charge try and charge you thousands of euros to scan it in for you. So none of that is in any way appropriate for a modern democracy. And the bill does nothing to, to deal with it. Uh, the public participation on its face kind of preserves kind of historically liberal regime. So we've always re had public participation pre-EU, pre our pre house. It does, as Marcia uh, kind of mentioned, it does retain a lot of stuff that isn't really good on a public participation front, such as the, the, the SIDS, the strategic infrastructure, but also large scale residential, where there's a lot of closed door private con uh, consultations between the developer and the planning authorities that nobody ever really knows about what's going on. So is it consultation? Is it lobbying? Who knows? Because we'll never know. Um, and there's also limitations on public participation at the plan making stage. So there's a kind of concept where the, the government will issue kind of directives and policies, which the local authorities will have to uh, use to amend their plans, uh, which again, will be kind of fast track which basically means the public and councillors will be excluded or their, their, their contributions will be minimised or neutralised, which I think is very, very bad. Uh, um, a huge kind of retrograde step, you know, it's going from a democratic system to a kind of a te technocratic system that you might see in the 1970s. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's just, I don't think it's appropriate for a modern a democracy that we have today. Um, then on access to justice, like people, there's a lot of a very lot of toxic narrative about this, because obviously it's been it does the most harm to developers and economic interests. So, but I think it's worth emphasising that the Court of Justice has stressed on numerous occasions that access to justice is a key element of environmental protection. That it essentially the Aarhus Convention, the EIA Directive, and so on, gives uh, not only gives members of the public the right to enforce environmental law, it gives them the duty to do that. So, so people who are taking judicial reviews are actively enforcing the environment uh, and they're doing so under laws that Ireland agreed to as a member state and a party to the convention. So when people are criticized or attacked for doing that, uh, particularly by politicians who actually agree to this stuff, uh, it's, it's a really very, very dangerous attack on the rule of law. Uh, and the, the European Court has stressed that the, this kind of overlap between individual rights of access to justice and the kind of broader public interest in environmental protection was how the system was designed to operate. This is, was just done on purpose. It's a political decision. Uh, and the fact that it may introduce delay to an individual project is, is the price that is worth paying to have environmental protection. Uh, and it's really important because we're, we're transitioning to a post-carbon world. So we need to have good development. If we don't have good development, if we keep giving planning permission or to fossil fuel, uh, uh, to road, uh, you know, road transport, to the wrong sites, sorts of development, the bad will push out the good. So, and the state on its own can't enforce the rules, particularly when the state is both a promoter of uh, uh, industries which are, which are harmful, and at the same time, it's supposed to be acting to prevent environmental damage, for example, say like the dairy industry, but there's other, there's other examples of it as well. Uh, so that's why you need the public. You need this. We, and, and like people it can't be overemphasized that when you attack access to justice, you are attacking the environment. You are saying that we don't, we want to have a lower standard of environmental protection in this country. Uh, and and that's, that's the critical point about the access to, you know, we, we can go through all the technicalities of it, but the reason the attacks on access to justice are so strong is because the, it's so effective. It's really, and it's proven to be effective across the board. So for example, the, the N6 Galway bypass, the Shannon LNG project, uh, really bad overzoning in, in County Meath. And there's numerous cases where the public have taken cases against projects which were granted planning permission by public authorities, which were harmful for the environment, which breached uh, environmental law, and which it fell to in, in ordinary individuals, many of whom are on this call, to take, uh, to take cases, often at great ex personal expense and a personal risk, in fact, including, I mean, Marcia has this, the scars to, <laughs> to prove it. And, and you know, you, you talk about serial objectors and serial whatever, what about serial uh, applicants? 
you know, Marcia's case where the applicant has put in three separate applications for the same thing, they keep keep going, they don't never get criticized. <clears throat> so I think it's it's important to be informed about all of that. Uh, the government has introduced a web of restrictions which are absolutely guaranteed to prevent people doing that job. And um, and they've removed one of the key protections in relation to essentially preventing people having to risk bankruptcy or go out of business to take a case. Uh, and they're replacing it with some kind of phantom system that doesn't exist and nobody can explain exists, which is a, a major problem. Um, and it's a long way from the, you know, the, I looked at the program for government and uh, the, the program for government commitment was to review and reform the judicial review process while always, always adhering to the EU law and the Aarhus Convention. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, in my view, like the bill, you know, the bill is just flawed. It's, it's a case of, if you want to get to where you're going, I wouldn't start from here. It's just, it's not, it's so huge, it's so unmanageable, I don't think it can be knocked back into shape. And I think it's, it's something that should really just be abandoned and started from scratch again. So, so that's it. I'm happy to ask any questions or answer any questions that are asked. <clears throat> Hopefully I've stuck within my time. Yeah, you've been amazing. That's that's a wonderful overview. Thanks so very much, Fred. I, I was laughing actually when you were speaking about and board being stuck back, board and all of being stuck back in the 70s and the difficulty of getting to Dublin to see paper files. I couldn't tell you how often I've had to either jump the bus or get the husband to drive to get an appeal into the board for the a lot of times. There's just there's no other way and it's very difficult. Um, and, and it is what it is. And, and what you were commenting on, the, the, the reduction in democracy arising from the plan making process proposed in the bill. Our planning executive in Cork County Council has essentially said to us that when you have the pre, the first pre-draft of your county development plan, or in your case, Oliver, the city development plan, the, plan, the, the, the executive planners come to us as councillors because we're the representatives of the people living in the communities. And they run their plans past us. And they've told us that they won't, under the current bill, they won't be coming to us anymore. They'll be going to the Office of the Planning Regulator. And that, that's the effect that centralization through the proposed bill will have. And that's really wrong. Um, somebody very helpfully put in the chat a tractor's fantastic last slide, which would actually be a really good final picture for this whole discussion. It was done by Chris Moody and Chris is on the call. So Chris, thank you so much. Um, it's a fantastic. Fantastic cartoon that says it all. Stephen Matthews has joined us. Stephen, thank you so much for coming. It's great to see you. We have huge anticipation of what you're going to tell us about what we can do with this unwieldy piece of proposed legislation. Um, so up to you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Marcia. And thanks for agreeing to chair it and to the Just Transition Greens for organizing it. And hello to Fred and uh, Attracta. Um, We've met in the committee rooms on several occasions <laughs> to discuss this. Um, and um, just a little bit of the background of who I am. I, I recognize some of the names on the, on the call, but I, I wouldn't know everybody. Um, I studied planning and environmental management about 20 years ago in DIT. It was something that, was, uh, that I was passionate about. I could see that without proper planning, um, everything falls apart. You know, it's the cornerstone of everything that we do around our transport, around our housing, around everything. You all know that, everybody on the call knows the importance of planning. So I went back to college to study it and I got an opportunity to do that. And uh, that was in about 2002, that was pre-SEA um, time. Um, and I never thought when I was studying 20 years ago, that I'd be now chairing an Oireachtas committee that was going to oversee this mammoth piece of legislation. Um, I was a councillor in Wicklow for uh, a good few years as well. I served on the Regional Planning Assembly and uh, EMRA, East Midlands Regional Assembly, and I served on planning SPCs and planning municipal MPCs when they existed during the town council days. Um, so I was about 13 or 14 years on that. So I've been a long time around planning and kind of see the good in it and see the, 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 the deficits and the gaps in it. And um, I suppose that the piece of legislation that, that we have before us now at the moment, uh, what I've always been trying to stress is it's the first draft, it's the first shot at something. And we heard quite a lot of evidence at committee sessions that it was problematic uh, from legal experts such as 
Fred uh, uh, and others uh, from environmental experts such as Attracta and others and across a very wide spectrum of people they raised issues with us. Um, we had 10, nine or 10, I think nine actually, we had 10 planned, but we, I think we ended up with nine pre what's called pre-legislative scrutiny sessions. And I think Fred talked about the heads of the bill. So generally what we would get is the heads of the bill. And you would have a kind of a small explanatory note after each head to say, this is what this is trying to do. And this might be the reason for doing it. We didn't have that with this bill. So it was a really mammoth task. When this landed on January, whatever date it was, 20, 20th of January or whatever it was last year, um, it was a huge task to try and read through it. It was a huge task to even try and print it off. Like it's 700 and something, uh, 780 pages or something like that. But I did, and I know several others did. Uh, there's a tractor. I can match your folder. Uh, I, I can double your, your folder for what I have here in front of me. Uh, but I went through it line by line, you know, line by line by line, uh, disappeared from my family for about three weeks into the, into the uh, office and just went through it line by line. It was incredibly difficult to go through it because it's only described as trying to like spot the ball with just one picture or not having the ball or something. I, I, I don't know. And we did find gaps and we found holes and we found uh, kind of what I would call like drafting errors, even uh, sections that weren't completed. Um, that section on costs protection was just, you know, it was a couple of lines in it and it didn't give much detail and clarity on it at all. And of course that raised a massive amount of concerns as well. Um, but we, we went through our 10 meetings, nine meetings, and we compiled all the evidence, the written, I think we got about 16, um, submissions from groups some that we'd written out to and requested so like experts in planning such as Bernard Grist people like that um, we got a huge range of submissions from short-term letting uh, agents across the board everybody that's affected by the planning system uh, we went through all of those we tried to incorporate there was a lot of crossover because a lot of the concerns that people had were common concerns right across the board and what we did was try and compile all that and we produced our pre-legislative scrutiny report and in that report we had about I, I can't remember off the top of my head now it's about 150 recommendations now I know that was reported at the time as being a huge amount of recommendations but to me it's not like for a bill that size 150 recommendations I don't think is is huge at all and in fact I think if we had more time and longer time and, and, and more opportunity we would probably come up with, with more recommendations but that's where we are and I know people say it's rushed. Um, I kind of balance that a little bit by saying this process has been going on, I think, for about 18 months now, so probably longer now. It's probably going on nearly uh, two years at this stage. Um, there was a planning advisory forum. Fred and Attractive would know more about this. I think Attractive was actually on, on one of those uh, stakeholder groups uh, with Antashka, I think, Attractive. I can't remember. Um, so there was that review went on with stakeholders, with planning experts, probably with construction people. Um, and then we also had a couple of sessions within the committee where the department came in and we looked at these kind of themed headings around it, around the development plan, around enforcement, around a few other bits and pieces. We never actually got to the judicial review uh, opportunity one. And then we ended up with this draft bill published on the, on the 26th or 26th of January went through it and we produced a report. Now, I think a lot of the recommendations in the report are sensible. I think they address uh, or they highlight some of the uh, issues that were raised with us by the experts. And to be honest, it was a privilege and it was great to have access to so many experts across the board to come in that give their time to us to, to kind of inform us because we have to pass legislation. That's our job. And uh, I, I just kind of thank those people for the time they gave to us. We've issued this report of recommendations. Um, I don't know when we're going to see the next uh, iteration of, of this bill, um, but I think there's more, a lot more work to be done to the draft that was published in order that we do address those areas around access to justice, access to information, that stuff even Fred mentioned about the electronic access to, to documents as well. I do think we recommend that, that in there somewhere um things like you know you're right the the the, the five-week period should be when it's up for everybody to view it shouldn't be when it's 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 submitted 
A um, couple of other bits and pieces like that. Um, the, the transitional arrangement section is actually not there, which to me is a difficulty as well. I would expect to see that in the next iteration. There's another section there that's not, uh, that's blank as well. I think it's about fun fairs and concerts and things like that. Um, and I would expect an explanatory uh, note that we get with most pieces of legislation with the next publication of this. We have requested that. One of the things we did get was a sort of section comparator. So say section five is something, section five of the old act <clears throat> is something that came up regularly. That's now section eight. And we that's all we have to compare one to the other. So it's quite a difficult exercise. I think it's a worthwhile exercise. I think nobody could um, doubt that what we had was quite difficult to get through. The current planning acts, the number of amendments, the whole complexity of, of, of everything that feeds into planning now, uh, I think it was becoming very difficult for planners, for the board, for everybody, even for uh, people who were submitting planning applications to have certainty and surety in what they were doing. So I do think the Planning Act needed to be pulled together, brought into one piece of legislation. And um, yeah, that's what we have now. But just the amount of time I have spent, not just on this, but the reason I am here, sitting here where I am in the position that I am, is because I was committed and understand the absolute uh, importance and value of planning in absolutely everything we do. And if you get planning, if you get planning right, sometimes people don't notice. But when you get planning wrong, it's there for generations to see and to suffer from. So, um, yeah, I, I just want to see a proper planning act. Um, thanks, Marcia. I, I actually wasn't too sure what I was meant to do there. It's just a brief overview and introduction. So I don't know if do we do questions and answers now. Thanks. We do. we do. And thanks so much both for that, for your work on, um, on the, at the committee level and for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, can, can I just ask you, Stephen, because everybody's going to want to know this. What are the opportunities for change? You've issued the recommendations at committee level. Um, will all of those potentially be taken on board? Will only some? And even if they are taken on board, the second draft comes. Is there then an opportunity to go back in there again? Does the public get to comment? You know, give us a sense of what happens down the line from here. Okay, sure. So um, essentially, when the committee does a piece of pre-legislative scrutiny, they produce a report, and generally they'll have a, a number of recommendations. And those recommendations are they're crafted from the expertise of the witnesses that come in and the issues that they raise. It, it also can come from unsolicited submissions, and it comes from our own knowledge and interaction with people as well over, over the years, and our own local knowledge as councillors, etc. Most of the most of the people serving on the on the on the committee would have been councillors at one stage, and so they'd be familiar, familiar with county development plans, local area plans, etc. Um, so we make those recommendations. There is absolutely no obligation on the minister to take any of those recommendations on board. They're recommendations of the committee. However, I would always say that where they are sensible, where they're backed by evidence, where they're reasonable, um, and where we point out the difficulties that parts of this. Uh, proposed piece of legislation may create. I think there's always an opportunity um, at committee stage, but also among uh, colleagues in government to discuss them and say, look, this is problematic and should should and needs to be addressed. So I think if you can provide good evidence for something, um, you generally get a fair hearing. Okay, that's very helpful. And Stephen, it actually leads into a question which somebody has asked through the chat. Vanessa has asked, and um, because she she doesn't have her voice at the moment, why was no heads of bill done? That would have helped everybody to understand the justification within each section. And what is the problem the bill is, bill is trying to solve? How are those problems validated? And how is the response to those problems validated and justified? And Sorry, what, what was the, the open question, Marcia? So I missed that. Why was no heads of bill done? Yeah, that, I can't answer that question. I don't know why no heads of bill are, are done. Um, the only other piece of, can be correct on this now, but I think the Land Development Agency um, bill, when we did it, didn't come as a heads of bill because I don't think we did PLS on that. So I don't know why it didn't come as heads, heads of a bill, uh, possibly because it's an existing piece of legislation and there was been amendment made to parts of it, but that's why it came in that form, but uh, I don't know. I'm sorry, the second question? So the second question was, what exactly is the problem or are the problems that the bill is trying to solve? Well, that's, that's a long question. I think maybe, um, 
So I think across the board from everybody that came in, they said the planning act, so the 2000 uh, act and the multiple, multiple amendments that have come in over the last 22, 23 years were, it was difficult to follow. I think if you ask planning experts out there um, that the, the act as it was, it had just become unwieldy, un complicated, uh, very difficult to, to, um, to navigate and was causing difficulty. So I think the consolidation of all of it was one objective in this. Um, there's a number of good things. And I, I think the 10-year the uh, development plan is not a bad idea. Um, now, I take on board what you said, Marcia, about the executive and the council saying that, you know, we'll be going to the uh, planning regulator with this. We won't be going back to the council. Now, I think we do recommend opportunity for councillors to input into that review, like that halfway stage, because I think it is important to review uh, any county development plan. We've also sought reporting back to councillors as well, like if there's a, a, I think it's every, every two years reporting back on the recess on the regional, um, what are they called, the regional and economic, uh, regional spatial and economic strategies, the, 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 um, the regional guidelines. So, you know, reporting back to councillors, I think is important in that. Um, this, the environmental planning portal, is that what it's called? The environmental assessment portal, I think, could be a good source of information to go to. You know, it's kind of difficult sometimes to find the documents you're looking for. To look, we, we recommend that applications for, you know, the board to, to give direction on whether environmental impact assessments were required or NIS was required. All of those, like, it's, it's kind of difficult to find this all the time. Like, you go in, I find the board's website really difficult to navigate at times. Sometimes I, I actually Google what I'm looking for and it will direct me to the page rather than trying to go in and navigate the, um, the board's page. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I mean, uh, there's others who would observe there's other issues with the planning system that are contained in this, but maybe not addressed properly. Yeah, yeah. look, I, I'm going to throw it open to the floor because there are lots of questions coming in in the chat. People are, are clearly very anxious to ask questions. So we're going to do that. And if those of you who've asked questions in the chat would like to voice them um, to either Fred or Attracta or Stephen, please do put up your hands. I'll do it by hands, okay? Um, don't wave at me because I mightn't see you. I'm over a couple of screens. So put up the electronic hand. And if you've asked the question in the chat and you'd like to ask it out loud, do. And if you don't, we'll come to any questions in the chat that weren't asked at the end. Is that okay? Nod fiercely, everybody. Yeah. Oliver, all, all I can see is you nodding. Okay, so first hand up is Cormac. Cormac McKay. Hi, uh, thanks for um, uh, taking my question. Just uh, to Fred there, you seem to have a lot of experience with the uh, House Convention and have previously brought cases against Ireland. And Ireland has been reprimanded with really no real acknowledgement from the government or any way to comply with the uh, House Convention and even making uh, another complaint uh, with regards to this bill, um, what difference will it make if uh, we haven't complied up until this point? Thank you. Well, you kind of assume that the state will obey the law. <laughs> Uh, and that will be fairly anxious to do that. Uh, now, obviously, in, in, that's in an ideal world. And the reason we have the Air House Compliance Committee and things like that is when they don't they get it wrong or they don't do it right, and that's it's a it's a safeguard. But the primary obligation on the state is to actually comply with the Air House Convention, um, and it, it's it's an international treaty, so it kind it kind of owes a duty of cooperation to other parties. Uh, at an international level that it will comply and that's kind of the basis for international treaties it's based on kind of a mutual respect and cooperation between states so you know it is it is problematic that we're not complying it's problematic that we're moving from a position of compliance to one of non-compliance uh, it's very problematic that the irish government Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, the green party have even approved a bill in draft form which very, very obviously doesn't comply. And so, uh, you know, I, I think the focus isn't on, you know, I, I don't think it's fair to, to say Ireland was reprimanded. It's not really a reprimand. It's basically 
the compliance committee and the members of the meeting, the parties determined that there's non-compliance. It's not, it's, it's not as dramatic as that. Um, so the question to ask is, what, first of all, why do we approve a bill without any analysis of our house com compatibility? So as far as I'm aware, there's no published analysis of that. And, and Eamon Ryan is the minister responsible for our house. He was at the cabinet table that approved this. Uh, and it seems that he, he went into it blind, really. And so it, that could have been addressed quite easily by actually do, going through the kind of normal route of um, uh, democratic lawmaking, which is actually having, you know, building it up, issues, papers, objective analysis, uh, heads of bills, where all of this thing can be can be worked out. And that's the idea of how it should be worked out. But when you launch a draft bill in almost, and it's not a consolidated bill, I have to just pick Stephen up. It's not a consolidation. It's a complete redrafting of the Planning Act. It's new legislation. It's uh, it's taking it apart and putting it back together again. So it's not like a Taxes Consolidation Act or Social Welfare Consolidation, where you take legislation that's been amended a lot and just put in a new act. It's completely new. And, um, you know, it, it looks, it, it just gives the wrong impression that when you produce a, a, a draft bill, which is drafted in the language of legislation, not at a high level in the language of kind of objectives, uh, and it very obviously doesn't comply with our, our international law obligations. Uh, so that's, I think that's a major problem with it. And it's very hard to, to roll back from that because the changes that are need, need to be making are, are, are quite fundamental to the structure of the, of the bill. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a tweak, it's a, it's a complete redraft of sections of it. Uh, and politically that's hard to, to kind of, to, to, it's, it's kind of like a U-turn for the politicians. So they've, they've kind of put a, 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 a stake in the ground and said, this is what we've recommended. And then if it turns out to be unviable, they have to kind of back away from it. So, so they're the kind of issues that I see around the our house aspect of it. Thanks, Fred. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. thanks, both. Cormac, are you happy with that response? Uh, yeah, and I have asked Eamon Ryan to seek uh, legal advice from the Attorney General um, on our compliance with the Ahaus Convention. And I've lodged that, in, uh, lodged that with my lobbying return personally. Um, yeah. So that's there for public record. Yeah, we just, we've, just, um, we've asked for that, actually. And we've got a kind of a fairly vague answer in that the drafting was guided by the spirit of our house or something like that. We've never been given, and there are there is um, advice from a, a group of barristers and, and a planning consultant that went into this and the Department of Housing has steadfastly refused to publish their two reports on the access to justice um, part of it. They've, they're um, hiding behind the, the AG's exemption from FOI. As a, as a reason not to publish that advice. I think it's also important just to realise, forgive me for jumping in there, but um, there have been many cases where or instances where the Attorney General basically has been wrong. The Attorney General, with the greatest respect, is not infallible. And um, that's why there are so many judgments against Ireland from the EU Court of Justice and indeed findings from the Compliance Committee. So just saying that we've had advice from the Attorney General and it's grand, fingers crossed, uh, it simply isn't good enough. We should be really seek, seeking proper, independent, really, you know, robust, uh, uh, politically independent, because let's be, be clear, the Attorney General is a political appointee. Um, and they're, they're, you know, it is not just in, in the context of environmental litigation, but the agenda of, of the government and indeed the, the report issued by the Attorney General in respect of, I think it was, one of the nursing home scandals was very clear in terms of an agenda to prevent accountability of the state. Um, so there, there are really serious issues here to be questioned in terms of what we want about it from our democracy. Um, and uh, I think it was page 36 of the, the report from the pre-legislative scrutiny, 30 or 36, uh, in the first session with the department where they acknowledged that there had not been an independent review in our house. I'll just dig it up and put it in the chat. Um, but um, yeah, sorry for jumping in there. And, and, and just on, on top of that, it, it was very much highlighted at last year's Citizens' Assembly uh, for Dublin on um, how our local uh, politicians really have lost all uh, input into local development and local plans 
with the the SDGs and how they bypass the the local development plan. So um, and those recommendations from the citizens assembly were handed to government in January, and there has not been one single debate in the doll with the findings of the citizens assembly. It's just been completely ignored. Um, and it was quite damning on how bad our local democracy is in Europe, only second to Russia. In, in fact, we may even be worse than Russia now. That's how bad our local democracy is. Thanks, Gormick. As, as a local representative, yeah. I completely concur with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you for your input. Thank you, everybody, for your answers. We'll move on. Oliver, your Thanks. hand is up next. Uh, thanks, Marcia. And un unfortunately, as, a, as another local representative, I, I have to agree with, with yourself and Cormac too. Um, um, and, and maybe that that might go into my question. So look, if, if there's there's 18 months left in, in, in this government and until the next election must happen. Uh, and, you know, a, a bill of this magnitude, given the time that's ahead, it, it, it can be, you know, written fully and into a, a, a good way. Um, and if it is, then it it will be a, a milestone bill for for the government. Um, and even if it if it's done if it's done well, if it's done badly, it will be a a milestone bill. Um, so my question, I suppose, for Fred and Attractor as well as Stephen, um, what would you like to see changed about the planning system right now? Um, you know, what are the issues that you think should be fixed? Um, and if this is a milestone bill for, for the government over the next 18 months, what are the, the key things that should be there, um, whether they're addressed in, in the draft bill or not right now? Thanks, Marcia. Which of you would like to take that first? Uh, I, I can just be brief. <clears throat> um, like climate change, everything we do now has to be aimed at climate change. Every single thing. And unless we and, and like basically what we do now has to work like we've no we don't have time for experimentation. So our housing, our how we move around, where we work, it has to we have to get that right. Uh, and if we're folk, if we're just obsessive about building very expensive, tiny, dark uh, apartments in inaccessible locations with no green space, uh, that to me and that's what that's what's being outputted at the moment in volume from the planning system because i see a lot of stuff uh so we're not we're not building proper communities we're not planning for proper communities uh we are just facilitating massive poor quality development uh, and whatever whatever way the, the, the bill goes unless we can build uh livable communities with low carbon low energy footprints then the then the bill will fail, or how, and it, even if even if we get it, we'll have to do it again because at at some point we will have to say actually no we can't do this this just won't work we have to build we'll have to switch to some other way of developing our society, uh, and like the time's running out we we only have six and a half years till twenty thirty, so you know it's just it's just so important that we get it right because we don't have time to to do it again. So what you're saying, Fred, that if there was one critical thing that had to be included, it would be cognizance of climate change and around creating communities through planning, sustainable, genuinely green communities through planning. Would that be it? Uh, I think that that more or less sums it up. Yeah, that's very much better than I put it. Yeah. No, you said it. <laughs> <laughs> in, a lot, in a lot a more long winded way. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, a tractor, would you like to add to Fred's delightful answer? So I'll continue. Sorry, you tried to go ahead. You go ahead. No, no, no. Stephen, you go first. So to add to Fred's wish lists there, um, and I think we'll all have a similar wish list on this. Um, like I think the Climate Act is 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 strong, you know, and that that you know it needs to be compliant with that. But I'd also like to see, you know, we 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 ignore that biodiversity cri crisis there as well. And what I'd like to see is is biodiversity action plans having that statutory footing, like the climate. Uh, Climate Act and have to be incorporated in all those planning decisions. Um, one thing that became clear, apparently, you know, it was apparent through a lot of it was that um, the kind of 
this desire to have timelines, to have certainty on timelines. So if you submit a planning application <clears throat> or you submit an appeal or whatever it might be, they should have certainty on the decision making. That cannot happen unless you've got well-resourced uh, local authority planning offices supported by that myriad of expertise that's needed now on flood risk, on biodiversity, on climate, all of those areas on transport. Similarly with on board Planola <clears throat> and similarly with the judicial system as well. That's what, to my, to my mind, the, the, the difficulty is the lack of the complexity of the decisions that have to be made, the pressure being put on and the, and the resources that are available to people to make those decisions. And I think that's where we're getting problems in the decision making processes as well. And I think, I don't know, Fred, would be best place to comment on that. So that's what I would like to see for the planning system, well resourced, proper planning. Also, that kind of aspect of the the place making that the the community gain the common good that should go with planning applications as well um county architects for example looking at planning uh planning uh, like from a higher view rather than a planner just looking at an individual application on, on, on his own site um and there was one other thing i can't remember what i was going to say yeah i was talking to a, a senior planner quite recently and it's on that thing that they're, that they're spending so they're spending a huge amount of time making sure that everything everything is done correctly everything's done correctly and not enough time i think on using that planning uh, you know principles and education and training and all that stuff that they've got about those areas like placemaking and public spaces and that interconnectivity and that community building that space i think that's lacking in applications and i don't think there's been enough consideration given to it at decision making stages Very Thanks. interesting. Thank you, Stephen. That's very interesting. Um, although I would say as a member of a local authority that they are so under-resourced by government that they couldn't possibly begin to create communities. They can't plan at all. They're so reliant on developers to come forward with money to do what they're desperate to do. That's just my opinion. Um, Attracta, I don't know if you agree with that. Um, thank you, um, Marcia. Uh, I'm cheating. I'm sort of taking everybody's comments on board into my one wish um, and I'm going to cheat like them and, and say a few things more. So I, I really endorse what, what uh, both Stephen and Fred have said, but I, I think fundamentally we just actually need to look at just the appalling state of affairs that there are for just ordinary human beings in this country at the moment. Like the most basic requirement in terms of a roof over their head and we can't give that to people. And, and the dreadful thing about this bill for all the spin about certainty, speeds, you know, uh, and clarity, is it actually does nothing for the delivery of houses. I mean, there are basic things, there are basic th things that are done in other legislation to ensure not just the bona fides, but the capacity of, of developers to deliver and, and to tie them really into that. But this is all, again, about fast tracking permissions and responding to a developer led agenda. Um, in terms of just concessions and a deregulatory agenda in terms of removing uh, participatory rights, access to justice rights, etc. And I think until we actually get real around the fact that that doesn't work, you know, it's never worked because ultimately that's not consistent with the laws that we are governed by in Ireland in terms of EU law and international law. So we just end up getting ourselves stuck and in court and tied up and delayed and it costs money and it brings the whole country into a, a cycle of bad reputation and and failed delivery for people uh, and both in terms of housing and climate change infrastructure that's entirely unacceptable so i think what we really need to do is actually not sit back and and look to just sort of be complacent that we've now got a nice pls report with 153 recommendations whether you agree with all of them or not but the simple fact of the matter is we cannot let happen what happened before Christmas, where there was effective coup on the, on, on board Planola in terms of reversing three decades of, of policy of decision to keep the board independent from political control. And we had a very robust PLS report which talked about undue control of the minister. And yet the government went in and voted for that bill effectively with no change to that, you know, excessive control. So we need to really, you know, and, and my wish for this bill is that we will hold our politicians to account. We will say this is simply not good enough as a piece of legislation. This approach will not stand. It will not serve. It is entirely unacceptable. 
and we want a, a much more participatory and consultative approach to solving the problems that we have within the planning system, which absolutely includes resourcing, but it does require compliant legislation because any of the shortcuts and the dodgy tricks that we try will just make us further unstuck and it will be the ordinary people and the environment in this country that suffers and as Fred has highlighted we just none of us if we care about you know our ability to continue life on this earth we can't afford the delays that this bill will cause. Well it was beautifully put. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oliver, I think your question has been answered. Yeah. Super. Definitely. Th thank you all very much. That was very good. Super. Thank you, everybody. Michael, your hand is up next. Michael Brown. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> hi. Uh, I'm just um, curious because like, I've been listening in now for an hour and a half. I've been following this for months and I'm still kind of at a loss as to what the point of the whole thing is, what What's the benefit of what, what they're doing and what's the end goal? I just so what what I'm hearing is a lot of work to try and fix something, fix issues that people are trying to introduce, like the weaken local democracy, reducing access to justice, create it, it seems to be very much developer led. Um, and to fix the SHDMS basically, which why people talk about judicial reviews really, I think, a lot of the time. And it's just we're gonna end up, I think, with I'm not sure what the benefit is. Yeah, it's just gonna end up with a mess more legal quagmire and, and problems and surely like no, whoever's in government when you make changes to planning it should be to improve things not to not to cause problems like, uh, like whoever it is that's in the government so I just don't understand what the what the end goal is for I'm a bit confused like we're, a lot of work now seems to be going in to try and fix something but what are they fix what's the what's the point of what they're doing I don't know yeah that's beautifully put who would you like to put that magnificent question to Michael <laughs> just uh, anybody there's an open question anybody Stephen it looks awfully pointed at you I'm afraid Stephen there there you are I see and I know we sort of approached this before um, I, I think we kind of you know outlined some of it there's some uh, suggested improvements I don't know I'd be interested in other observers what they what they think of it. you know I've been buried in this for months but I I'm keen to hear what other observers maybe what Fred and Attract to think is, is trying to be fixed here or not. Yeah, like the like if you look at the the reason the SHG failed ultimately was they were just unpopular. So we we haven't really figured out, you know, the kind of logical logically prior step of what like what is our urban environment going to look like in a in a post carbon world. We've just kind of handed it over to developers to either continue building sprawling housing estates in green fields or large high rise apartment buildings in open, big sites in the cities. And there's, so there's no real thought has been given to, well, actually, you know, how do we convert Dublin with its kind of terraces and things into a modern city? You know, how do we do that? Like, and that's not something that can be imposed on people. They'll fight for their communities and they are fighting. So the issue isn't about access to justice. The, the issue is, and I, I think, the question from Michael really posed it. What's the what? It's like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The answer is forty-two, but what's the question? <laughs> so that's so we actually we haven't figured out what the question we're asking. That this that this bill, which I sincerely hope is called number forty-two at some some point. <laughs> we so we need to build a bigger computer to figure out what the question is, and um, that that is that. But that is the question. How do and like what we're producing is homelessness and dereliction and uh, very very expensive uh, rental properties that nobody can actually afford, and you know the census showed that home ownership has precipitously declined over the last two decades. So um, uh, you know if you're a young person today and my daughter is twenty, like she's going, I'm never going to get a job that where I can afford somewhere to live in Ireland. That's she's she's plugged into that. Um, and we can't just keep going and keep producing homeless people, derelict buildings, and very, very expensive, poor quality development. We have to we have to address the fundamental question of where are we going to live in the in the twenty first century, and how are we going to deliver it? And I think the state has to play a significant role. So it can't just be handed over to developers and a laissez faire planning system. It just can't. It's too important. Uh, like. The previous experience was we handed it over to, you know, to 
private you know private mortgages which failed created a massive amount of bad debt now we're handing it over to funds international funds who are creating kind of a, a rent rentier economy and and the output of that is homelessness and, and dereliction so we like that they're the questions and it's, it's a great it's a really good question because it's it's asking what you know what are we what what problem are we solving we keep asking that question and and nobody can answer what problem the planning draft planning bill is is aimed at solving it's all kind of based on assumptions that aren't even articulated or written down in in, in my view yeah, I, I completely agree and I think I, I really think it is an excellent question and it says an awful lot that none of us can actually answer that and it, you know I mean the, just the terms of reference and the vagueness of the original remit for the review of, of the the Attorney General's review it, it, it just outstandingly irresponsible to be perfectly blunt uh, and I am speaking in a personal capacity when I say that um, but I think um, the, 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 the central issue I suppose is that the extent of challenge we have to face in both the, the areas of climate and housing and our energy crisis, the multiple crisis and our biodiversity crisis, which are facing us, um, they're really hard problems and they are going to be really, really hard to solve. And they're going to be controversial to solve because it, no, it's, it's, it's going to be a situation where you can't keep everybody happy. But the critical thing is to do it within the with to do it lawfully. And to bring as many people on board and to make sure that you don't make mistakes along the way. But one of the key problems with this bill is that it, at its heart and at the very start of the bill, it provides for extraordinary powers to centralise control within government in order to be able to send out stimuli which will force alignment in county development plans and remove the control and the local government democracy um uh, perspective on 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 how that that area is developed now that's all well and good if those stimuli are correct and if they're well thought through and they're robust etc but the real issue is is that we have seen endless policies from the government driving you know very controversial and very unsatisfactory things even just like you know the amount of apartments now that are, are just can't be built because they're just completely unviable economically um and this, the, you know, the, the type of things that really needs to be done here is that we need to have really robust controls and oversight around those policy stimuli from government. The bill doesn't deliver that. And moreover, in the judicial review changes, it makes it, it, it includes, you know, multiple decisions like that under these new restrictive rules and the very tight timeframes for them. So it's going to make us hard, it harder for the public to scrutinise those. So it is heading in exactly the wrong direction of travel for us all to be able to work together and support each other in solving what are going to be really hard and difficult choices uh, and how we solve the problems that we're going to collectively face to house the amount of people that we need to and to make the transition uh, that we need to, to save, save the planet, save ourselves. Um, um, could I, sorry, I tried to, sorry. Yeah, very good, Michael. Sorry, oh, sorry Marcy, yeah. Um, just on that, I mean, there is talk, I did ask this question at the committee. Uh, one of the objectives was to try and reduce the conflict, and conflict's probably not the best word for it, but uh, at planning application stage. So we all know we go through development plan processes and produce maps, coloured maps, zones, and or 20 or, or 40 written them, or whatever it might be. And to try and get the public engaged at that point, it's a, a, well, my experience in Wicklow is, you know, very few people engaged at that point, you know, unless you're looking for your land to be zoned, then you didn't really engage in it too much. Um, and one of the things that was proposed was that, that earlier engagement with people, so you would have these, now there's a number of types of, of there's these prior, priority area plans and urban area plans and joint area plans where to go across to local authorities and it was never, we never really got full detail on that. What was going to be, what was going to be within those plans? Um, now the Arch Royal uh, Institute of Architects were in and they talked about this kind of three, 3D three modeling. And I really think something like that. Now, I mean, again, I don't want to load more on local authorities and Marcy you referred to it yourself to say that there are planning, our, our local authorities are stretched everywhere. They're just stretched left, right and center and our planning services as well. And we know there's issues, difficult to try to put staff in and retain them and everything. But I do think if you could approach that kind of master plan type 
stuff at the early stages of development plans, local area plans, um, I think you would engage a lot more people in the process. You would get a lot more views at the time rather than the first thing that somebody knows is a site notice goes up and it's for 300 apartments or 400 houses or whatever it might be. That's often the first time people, and they come to you and I'm sure they come to you as councillors and go, how did this happen? You know, why is this happening? You say, well, there's a whole democratic planning process and development plan crafted, but you know, I didn't know anything about it. And it's to pull more people in. I've always felt that you, you can, you don't come up with it. You don't come up with a worse idea by engaging more people. That's never happened before. You know, you may not get everybody being happy, but at least everybody's views taken on board. Um, and I, I'd like to see more of that. How do we do that? By adding another thousand staff across local authorities, maybe. That's the kind of solutions that are, are needed. You know, I think I, I think their last kind of staff count of what's requirements across planning services, not just for planners, is over 500 staff. Uh, that would be across every colleges and engineers and architects and the whole lot. But um, sorry, that was just something I, I thought of. Thanks. Your point is well made, Stephen. It is really, really difficult to engage people around the county development plan drafting time. It's dry, the ads are dry, the language is dry, it's complicated, it's dense text. And then you've got these colored blobs on a map, which truthfully, like you've got an expertise in this and, and, and many of us who understand the whole planning field have an expertise in, in interpreting pictures that are technical. But I find as a counselor that an awful lot of people don't and none of it is designed to bring the public on board. Like if we wanna do that, we need to bring the plan stage of, of the country's development plan actually into communities. Um, and, and that's very difficult. That's time consuming and it's resource heavy. Um, it would be a wonderful thing to do, but it's very, very difficult to do. And a lot of the councillors, if that burden was put on them, don't have the expertise to do that. That's the truth. And um, they all have their own expertise, but not all of them have that expertise. So um, you've all answered really well, but it, I'm interpreting from this, Michael, is your question, you tell me, I still can't see a reason for having redrafted our planning legislation. I can see places where we might like to tweak it or focus differently um, or create further awareness on that stuff through it, through the existing legislation, but I can't see a reason to redraft it. Can you? Michael? Uh, no, I can't. <laughs> Don't ask me, no. Uh, no, I can't no, at all. So I'm, I'm still stuck as to what we're doing. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, Carl, Carl Strickland, your hand is up next. Thanks, thanks, Marcia. Um, I think it's more observations and, and probably questions. Um, I suppose the, first of all, the output of the Europe's committee, you know, there's 120 observations, given the constraints that they had and the uh, constraint of the actually process that they had to go through, there was a lot of good work done there. So I think hats off to um, everybody involved in that, first of all. I really take a point, um, Fred's comments on the Irish Convention, I think that is front and center. And I think that plus the access to justice is where the um, points taken out from this um, bill is so is so important. And the third point I'd just like to make is that your just your recent point, Marcia, is that about you know putting the citizen at the center of the process of county development plan. I know and I've heard that where a number of planning submissions that are gone through JR and are in, stuck in board panel, et cetera, for, for review, the developer is actually going back to um, the communities and asking, if you withdraw your submissions, we will let's sit down and come to what you want and to compromise. And that's what we should be doing at the very start. All of the procedures and processes of planning should include citizens at the center of the procedure and process that takes in the community needs and the environmental needs. They're the most important customers within the procedure and process. And by default, that's almost happening now with some of the messes that we've had with SHDs and um, litigations and uh, JRs and uh, the board plenal plenal back off. That's just uh, all, all I want to say. Thank you, Marcel. Yeah, that's nicely summarised. Well done, Carl. That's excellent. Would any of our panel like to comment on any of those pieces? Yeah, can I just jump in there? And it's sort of following on, on, on the, the earlier discussion as well in terms of, um, I agree about the importance about trying to engage uh, people early on in the process and particularly the challenges of doing that and making sort of the county development plan planning process meaningful to people. 
and, and supporting local authority staff in terms of the engagement strategies and technical training and communications, and et cetera, that, that's needed um, to facilitate that properly. But I do think there's a real risk that a lot of this front-loading plan-led approach is really um, a hidden agenda with a view to eradicating people's rights further down the road. And we've seen that particularly in the context of the strategic housing development uh, schemes, where basically, you know, once something is, is drafted as a strategic housing development plan, then the, the public's rights to engage or comment or anything further on um, if something is deemed to be compliant with the plan are really restricted. But the environment is constantly changing. The challenges are constantly changing and there needs to be the ability to adapt. But, you know, instead of being able to appeal those types of subsequent decisions within the SHD plan or the subsequent applications, um, the only recourse you have is judicial review. And I've seen, um, like even in my home constituency, issues where there have been really significant changes and deviations from the original plan and um, that have materially impacted the local community and, and the risks that they have in terms of engaging in JR are, are huge. Um, and I think that's a real problem with this focus on plan led and we need to be very careful around, you know, the safeguards that are put in place around that. The second thing is that this, this view of engaging the burden uh, on local authorities is actually huge. And there's a real risk in the context of these policy stimuli that can emanate from government with which force the county development plan to realign and to revisit itself could actually, even in the context of this proposal for a 10 year period of, of county development plans, mean that there are iterations of change and paroxysms and spasms of change stimulated within that 10 year window where basically you've got to go through a mini change process. And there's actually quite a lot in that in terms of the need to comply with the Strategic Environmental Assessment Directive and the participatory requirements. And again, I don't think that that has been properly thought through. You know, there's this assumption that we're moving to sort of a longer county development plan process. That's not actually what I think will emanate from this bill at all. When you look at the, the ability of the government to force alignment throughout the system. And I think there's an awful lot to be thought about in terms of the practicalities of participatory exhaustion and con consultation fatigue, um, both within the councils and within the public, and you will not get the level of engagement that is needed. I, I think that is so accurate. I suspect, Carl, you do too. Um, yes. Yeah. Very One card, please, yeah. Yeah. Consultation fatigue attractor, you mentioned it the other day, um, is, is a massive issue. Uh, even I, Miss Consultee herself, have stopped submitting my opinions to consultations because I think they're just not taken on board. That's the truth. Um, and there's too many, too many asks. So um, I couldn't agree more with you. And uh, again, our planning policy executive has said to us that the anticipated 10 year lifetime of a plan they feel will make a longer plan, despite what the bill proposes, um, and will bring more work. So all your commentary is absolutely um, reflective of what they have told us to from their, their, their expert point of view. Um, have we more hands up? Marcy, could I make a point just to come back? Um, Please. Uh, yeah. Following on, I think a track you mentioned is about the, um, the national planning statements, is that what they be called now, national, national planning statements, we recommend that they're brought into the Oireachtas Committee for scrutiny. And I think that would be very beneficial because I think that would give an opportunity. Um, and I wouldn't see it being a big, long, drawn out, like 12 week process or anything like that, but it would give the opportunity to bring in experts to see what's trying to be achieved here, what's the rationale for it, what are the possibilities that may come from it. And I, I think that would be, I think if that were to be agreed, I think that would be very helpful because. Um, yeah, I think it would. The problem with the, the national planning statements is that like they can be used for good as well as bad. And the fear is that like we've, the history of this with SPPRs is, is that these national 
mandatory guidelines have been used to prevent local authorities from adopting higher standards of development. Uh, most notably, the attempt by Dublin City to impose a higher standard of apartment than the, the government wanted them to have. And that's why the apartment guidelines were brought in. Similarly, with the perception that there were uh, unreasonable limits on high rise with the, the height guidelines. So the fear from a kind of from my side of the, the fence is that these national planning statements will just impose top down low standards. And like you see, you can see it again now in the revision of the urban development guidelines. So traditionally you had a 10% minimum open space in development. So that was kind of appropriate for suburbia. But when you go to high, to high density, you really need a population uh, uh, open space allocation, not, not an area-based one. So uh, if you look at Fingal, for example, they would have had 10% minimum and then a per population. And in a very high density, that can make a factor of three or four in terms of open space. And open space is like parks, playgrounds. That's what open space is. So developers are trying to put in a maximum 10% of open space by site area and to get away from the um, uh, the population based. So if you say, if you do that, say you double the density, which is what they're trying to do, that means you'll have half the amount of parks and stuff for people than you would expect. Uh, and that's what that's what happened. That's what's happening with these top down uh, enforced guidelines, unfortunately. Uh, and we're not really seeing them to be used to promote high standards of development. That that's that's the real issue. And um, I was going to follow, like the uh, just another comment, like the, you know, people are kind of talking about judicial review, but it's a very small number of cases. So we depend on institutions to provide quality in our development. We depend on the local authorities, uh, and Marcy has explained how hard it can be. And actually, just just even looking at a development plan making, councillors are just. The, the executive has much more knowledge and power in the process. Uh, and if the councillors want to go against the chief executive, they have a real uphill struggle. It's really hard. And then there's a lot of guidelines and things that they're that are thrown at them and they don't really know. And it's and you know, in, in some cases they're told stuff that isn't necessarily true. And um and we 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 really rely on a board panola and the board failed to do it. It failed to set the standard. So that it was perceived as being more in, in, interested in promoting government policy in terms of solving the house, housing crisis. Um, and that was the perception, I'm not sure whether it's the reality or not, who knows. But they, they went from a position where they were very respected for preventing some very bad development uh, uh, to a position where, um, you know, the ones that were challenged were found not to, not to that these were decisions that shouldn't have been granted. So we, I think we really need to have need to get that back you know it's really important that we get that back because they set the standard and we forget actually how fragile uh, our system is because it depends on these institutions so if they're if they're subverted or they're they're not allowed to do that job or they're not supervised to make sure they do the job then everything suffers so that's and that's that's where people we should be looking as well you know to make sure that that those, those people do their jobs correctly yeah and just just on the the point about the joint Oireachtas committee scrutiny, I I think it's an interesting idea, Stephen, and I I um I think the the Oireachtas committee has done an awful lot of good work and and manages to drive out an incredible amount of of detail and issue, uh, albeit that there was many areas of the bill that they weren't able to sort of touch in in similar details, but I think there's a real danger in relying on a joint Oireachtas committee. Because you have to, when, well, in my view, you have to, when writing legislation, is code for the worst possible situation and the worst possible government. And that is particularly, I think, the responsibility, um, I would hope, of the Greens in government in terms of thinking about the worst possible uh, configuration um, of, of a government that, and, you know, a majority control and a joint rock this committee. So it needs to be much more prescriptive in legislation around what the controls are around um, how these policies get developed, safeguards and mechanisms in the legislation around that, and, and to provide for wider accountability and the opportunity for greater public scrutiny. Otherwise, we risk giving a carte blanche to government 
in the future who will be potentially lobbied to death, as without question, governments have um, in the past, uh, and I fear including on this bill, um, and basically, you know, just driving an agenda which will not deliver the results that we as a society and economy um, and for our environment um, uh, are, are what our environment needs. So, um, yes, scrutiny by a joint directors committee potentially good, but sufficient. No, not in my book. Thank you. And just to follow on from that point, attract it like we've got to look at this from the you know where the uh, like that when, within here we're dealing with national legislation, but at local government level as well. And like I would I would love every member of the public to attend a county development plan meeting and to see the way some decisions are made, and then to remind them ten years later, say, do you remember that great guy? great guy that you're always voting for. Do you remember that zoning that happened on the floodplain or, you know, there's, there's no places in the school now or you have a shit transport system. Do you remember that zoning that you thought? And there is a result of those decisions that are made at local level and often because they got the numbers. And sometimes it just gets kicked to the planning regulator. And the planning regulator can miss some of these or if they're like, you can have a whole lot of what might seem like insignificant decisions, but put them all together and they become significant and they do have an impact on how an area or how a town develops, how water quality is affected. And all of those public places that Fred is talking about, those parks and public spaces throughout areas as well. So there is an element of, like that's the public scrutiny as well. You've got to be aware of the decisions that people make that you vote for. And yeah. I don't think a lot of the time they're, they're put together. I yeah, well, you, you can see that the councils even still today won't put their archives of their videos on online. So like where I live, Meads won't broadcast them, but we took a case for a bunch of councillors to get access to the videos, the planning meetings. Um, Leash and Offaly and a few, a lot of other ones don't actually broadcast their meetings. Um, and the other, like the other thing is like you said, like the OPR or whatever can't enforce everything. So that's why I think that this kind of private enforcement is very, is critical actually. And Stephen very rightly mentioned the climate action plans, which are an integral part of actually ensuring that, you know, it's not just about planning, like, so there, there is other stuff and actually getting biodiversity action plans into the same uh, legal framework is very important. But then you need the, the public to come and enforce that. So for the, the, the case in point is the Galway N6, where the board didn't even actually know there was a climate action plan and went ahead and gave planning permission for a huge road, uh, which on its own terms would have increased emissions. And but for our friends of the Irish environment who took a case against it, that road would, would they be getting ready to build it now? So it's, it's really, really important that, and particularly ENGOs are, are strengthened so that they can participate, they can even assist councillors with the plan making, but they need to be supported, they need to be given resources, uh, uh, and they need to be allowed into the conversations. Uh, and that that's and they're a critical part of the system, which again, uh, the bill is as a lot of measures that really are aimed at preventing ENGOs, uh, particularly international ENGOs, which are completely excluded uh, from being part of our system. So, you know, like, like it's really, it's, it's very important that all of the, the you know, the, all the pillars, access information, participation, access to justice, the public organizations, NGOs are fully activated uh, to, to, to deliver on environmental protection and uh, proper planning, I think. And if I could add to your list, Fred, local authorities, because Stephen, I am tired of local authorities being held to blame for things that go wrong in the planning system and God knows other systems but with specific regard to planning and knowing what the person you voted for, voted for it with regard to the planning system. If we weren't, if, if our local authorities were funded to buy land, to develop, to commission developers, to be in charge, then we wouldn't as a nation be at the behest of developers. And then you wouldn't see crooked planning decisions behind closed doors that FOIs have to reveal. We need to be able to look at a town, decide with authority what the population of that town should be, assess the road transportation, assess 
the civic offices, assess the school places, assess the health delivery, and then empower local authorities to deliver on the houses around the facilities that town can offer. But until we start trusting local authorities to do that and disabling developers from driving the planning system, we're always going to be looking at our public reps and saying, what do you vote for behind closed doors? I feel that very strongly. And until government takes responsibility for that, we're always going to be peddling backwards in our planning system. Well, Marcia, you need a different planning bill then. You don't need this one. Thank you. Yeah, you got it. Anyway, sorry, I didn't intend to rant because I am chairperson. There are no other hands up. There are some very intelligent and useful comments and questions in the chat. And I would encourage um, that, that we would maybe briefly look through them. There's, there's a couple of very relevant ones. Um, and that which perhaps is most relevant at this stage is a number of speakers have said that we don't need this, that it's not benefiting us, that it should be sunk. What do we, I, all of us as ordinary people do in the time that's left to either make this bill something worthwhile or to see it part? Um, and will there be public participation at any stage? When is our voice welcome? Well, I think um, obviously people can express their concerns to their local representatives. Um, I think they should be asking for all of the analysis to be published. Um, I suspect that some of it actually recommended against what was in, went into the bill. Uh, I think that um, the uh, I, I, even the CEO of one of the largest home builders in Ireland was on the television there three or four weeks ago who said we shouldn't be rushing into this. Um, and they would obviously be a direct beneficiary from some of it. And it, but what he basically said is we should wait and see how the, the large scale residential development procedure works out. Because, like, in fairness to him, I think they can see that. And I said it before: like a, a bad law makes weak cases strong, and that it's inevitable. With even with the best will in the world, when you change legislation, the the interpretation becomes less clear, and that leads to. I think conflict is the right word to use um, because people will will use that or take advantage of that to try and uh, push back on stuff that they're that's unpopular. So um, uh, we should we you know I'm not sure you know whether it should be abandoned, possibly, but uh, I think it should be done very carefully and very and with adequate time. And like in everything in the planning system, uh, these tight deadlines introduce bias into the system. I keep saying it. So mandatory deadlines introduce a bias to grant permission for stuff that shouldn't be granted. That's just a natural bias because our system has a presumption in, in favor of development on certain land. So, and that's what happened. So what, instead of having mandatory deadlines, we should have indic indicative deadlines, proper resourcing and a governance system so that uh, if there is a, a delinquent authority, and I don't believe that, that there is, like th this is a myth. The reason why they're slow is because they're overwhelmed, you know. So the board was given SHTs with not enough resources and forced to make decisions within uh, like a two, 10 weeks of the public participation ending for the largest developments. That's, that's just insane. And the board doesn't have local knowledge. So they went from being an appeals board to a local decision maker. So for like, they don't have, it's not within their competency to do this. And nobody really thought about any of that. They just assumed, uh, that it, it would all be grand, and it and it wasn't. So they're kind of doubling down on this now, and I think that's just going to cause even more problems. Like you, you just can't force things through. There's a natural length of time that certain things take, uh, and this imperative that everything has to be done in a rush. With the SHC, it didn't actually produce the housing at the end; it just produced lots of planning permissions that didn't get built. So, you know, I, I just think it's it's the height of madness, really. Thanks, Fred. Thanks. I was interested. <clears throat> Sorry, Fred. I, I had LRDs written down here because I saw that piece. I, I it was Claire Byrne show or one of the shows that that um, was it Glen Bay was on and um, mentioning about the LRD process and the LRD process was brought in. I, and what it triggered me was that go and see what the LRD process is in, in this now, and is it different? And um, those, those comments didn't really make 
sense to me unless the LRD process has been changed in this as well. Um, but I think there probably has been less uh, attention on LRDs. I think I think once anybody heard SHD, suddenly uh, uh, an alarm went off. Whatever, this is an SHD. This is bad. Yeah. And to be honest, and people may not agree with me, I don't think every SHD application was the worst in the world. In fact, some of them were good use of land at densities and scale, and some of them were good design, and some of them were appalling. Um, so, it, you, but I do think SHD, just once it got the brand sticker on, this is an SHD, everybody, and I don't think LRD has gotten it. Now it does restore that local democratic level where it does go to the local authority first, and, and which is better, which is a far better system, obviously. And, and the council are more bound to the objectives of the county development plan than the low, than the on board and all of which were given that scope fit to go beyond it, um, but in relation to on board and all of, like the board was dreadfully understaffed for a long long time. I think the staff count was two hundred in there uh, across the whole system, and when you think of the complexity and the amount of stuff that was going through there, like that should have been double or I, I don't know treble that amount of staff. I don't know what it should be to have a proper functioning to have a governance structure and a decision-making structure as well. So there was a lot of things wrong with on Borp and all that, that actually do need to come right and need to come right, not just pr properly, not just rushed and quickly. And uh, I just want to keep, I, actually, I think we're inviting the board into the, the committee before the end of the, this, this session. Um, so it'd be interesting to just get an update and, and progress from the board, recruitment, board numbers, I don't know what, I, a lot of the, the conversation was about, they were down to, I think, five board members at one stage, which meant they couldn't have two decision-making bodies because the quorum of three. Um, but I, I don't know how they are on inspectors as well. And I expect, I suspect that's another line of, of uh, work there that probably needs supplementing as well. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Attracta, have you any final words on what we can, I'm conscious guys, it's nine o'clock. I think some of us could probably talk about this all night. But it wouldn't be fair on the speakers and it wouldn't be fair on those who'd like to go. Um, oh, I'm quite happy to talk on my show. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, I'm not sure it'd be fair on the listeners. Um, but um, what can we do, Attractor? What can we do as public? It, it's not can, it's what we must do. Okay. okay, this is what we must do. Uh, going back to Stephen's point on accountability and the people who we vote for, this is going to be decided on by politicians in the Valera. And we must absolutely engage with our politicians and, and hold them to account and explain the extent of concerns that there are from multiple, like, you know, as, as was highlighted on prime time, you have one of the, the biggest home builders in the country actually coming out and saying, look, hang on here, pause for thought, you know, let things settle down and let's be able to evaluate. You have the leading lawyers in the plan field of planning and environmental saying this, you know, in terms of the Planning Environmental Local Government Bar Association, the Environmental uh, and Planning Committee of the Law Society, you have ENGOs, you have civil societies, you have notable academics in the field of planning um, and, and, and all of these different people warning that there, there be dragons here in, in respect of this bill. So now is not the time to do what this government has endlessly done and rushed legislation or changes through particularly at recess. I'm not saying that they're going to do that necessarily with this bill, because I think it has basically, it's taken a beating uh, unnecessarily so. But what I am really worried is that what we will see is piecemeal abstraction of bits and pieces of it shoved into legislation at the last minute and railroaded through. That's what we've seen over and over again at a time of recess when even the most vigilant uh, TDs and senators are just not capable, you know, physically capable of keeping pace with the extent and the volume of changes that are pressed through in guillotine debates um, and, and where really significant changes are made without even the semblance of debate or scrutiny in, in the, the chambers of both houses. So that's, we really need to be very clear in articulating that this is an unacceptable piece of legislation. This cannot be rushed. This must be subject to much more detailed and robust scrutiny and consideration 
and justification and consultation, because it is not something we can afford to get wrong. And we have to be really clear that we don't want any piecemeal approach to, to rushing things through and that there needs to be much, much more robust and comprehensive. And we have already lost an unacceptable 18 months plus in respect of the entirely opaque process that was undertaken in respect of the review conducted by the Attorney General. I mean, that's unacceptable. And we need to say it's unacceptable. I have typed as quickly as I can to take notes of all of that so that I can do it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Attractor. Fred, thank you so very much. Stephen, thank you so very much. You've all been amazing. Um, just, yeah. sorry, Martin, just no, one thing, please. and I, I noticed this in our PLS report when it came out, that recommendation number 38, we recommend that planning application fees should be reviewed uh, to reflect the amount of work that goes into it. And I think that's an important thing as well, that fees for planning applications have never been uh, in increased and there's a massive amount of work by local authorities there so we asked for the fees to be but we put it in as observation fees when in fact what we meant was planning application fees and uh, you know when you read over your work uh, you spot things and we have two there at 58 and 59 are uh, recommendations that are actually um, contradict each other and what we did what, what our intention was that the Recess reviews will be every two years. They would stay at two years and not go to four years because I think that regional, uh, you know, that reporting on the regional planning stuff is, is critically important. And we'd like to see that on county plans as well every two to three years, every year, even back to councillors. Indicators, you know, how much land you zoned, how much of it has gone on to develop, and what stage is that? It's very hard. You, you look at your county development plan from, from one six year period to the other and go, that land has been zoned in the last map. And in the map before that, and looking at it, so I think it's it's helpful for councillors to get that. Anyway, I'm I'm reading my own report here and making uh, <laughs> making changes to it as I go through it. But look, thank you very much. It's it's been a pleasure, and I like attract it would, and I'm sure Fred would stay up talking planning all night, yeah. and uh, maybe we will at some stage. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. And thank you very much, Marcia, and thank you everyone. And and thanks for the attendees everything. coming. Thank you. Stephen, I want to say before you go, thanks for your work on the committee and thanks for the report, which is actually very good. Um, I, I think the fact that none of us thinks this a total rehash of the planning legislation is necessary doesn't take from the work the committee has put in and the, re the recommendations that have come out. Um, so we just want to say that because we could be very hard on you because you're at the top. <laughs> and that might okay, you, need, you, need, you need to be hard on us. Like we have, like we have, um, we have massive challenges on climate and biodiversity, so you do need to be hard on us, and that's fine. I didn't come in here for an easy ride, like you know. So um, I'm happy to take that. Might we ask one last question, which is in the chat, seeing as you don't mind our being hard on you? If the recommendations made by the committee are not taken on board in entirety, will the Green Party um, go against the proposed bill? If the recommendations in their entirety are not included in the bill, yeah. uh, I think we'll work with colleagues and we work with experts and we work with everybody to ensure that we get a planning um, act that's fit for purpose and that serves what we need in terms of those challenges in terms of housing and land use and energy and transport and uh, I'd certainly won't give up and I'd stay the fight to ensure that we have proper planning uh, that pro that definition of proper planning sustainable development and in the common good and that's what I'm here to fight for and I won't give up on that fight. Can I ask a follow on yeah. question to that, Marcia? Um, yeah. The Green Party in opposition uh, made it very clear their opposition to the proposed heads of bill in 2019 that Fine Gael brought forward. Um, I refer to it as the bill to kill access to justice, uh, really draconian changes. I would actually characterize the changes proposed in this piece of legislation as being even worse and much more problematic. Um, and I would ask the question, will the Green Party support the changes proposed or will it support the recommendation that the changes in part nine of the bill be deleted? So the 2019 bill, that was called the Housing Planning and Development, and development. Bill, I think. Yeah, 2019. Uh, 2019, no, I do remember a very problematic one and uh it's gone now um but it's there manifest been... worse in this 
Yeah, so like I didn't expect it to evaporate. I did expect to see it, uh, its head reared in, in various forms at other stages. Um, I don't know. I don't know who was driving that one in 2019, but I suspect it was events of 2017 or 2018 that created a bill like that. Um, yeah, well, decision. But um, cer certainly part nine uh, does create a lot of difficulties and not just for myself in looking at them, across the board, the evidence from experts, you mentioned them yourself, the Pelga group and the uh, Green Bar Association, the Law Society, Planning Institute, I think, were actually uh, had difficulty with it as well, uh, across the board. So really what I would work on is that evidence of experts to make a good and reasonable case to say why. And the other side of it is as well, a developer doesn't want a piece of legislation that's going to uh, make development more difficult, more um, legal case again. You know, nobody wants bad laws. We all want certainty and we all want clarity and we all want to know that the planning system is there for the common good. And that's what I will continue to work for Attractive. Yeah, but all, all three, like it's, I quoted from the programme for government actually. So it says that the review of judicial review will comply with the IRS convention. So all three government parties have made that commitment. And it, and it must. Yeah. It must comply with the Our House Convention. Like, you, you, it, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, exactly. It's not, not a la carte. You can't just say Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And I do think it's important that the next iteration of this, uh, when we see it, is kind of stress tested against that. And um, I think that's important for everybody to know. Okay. Oliver, will we have a copy of the recording or a collation of the points from this meeting? Uh, yeah, so it's it, what we do. Um, uh, so we, 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 we've been, it, obviously the meeting has been recorded. So um, after the meeting, I'll uh, upload it onto YouTube and I can circulate it to all the speakers here. That's fantastic because if some of the participants are asking this question. I presume they can, can they get that link somewhere, Oliver? Can they? Yeah, uh, it, it'll be, if you go to the Just Transition Greens channel on YouTube, you'll, you'll find it. I'll probably have it up later on tonight. Great, great. That's superb. I am going to have to call Thank it you. a day. Okay. Uh, well done to everybody. Um, we might do this again, Oliver. <laughs> um, thank you all so very much for your fantastic contributions um, and your passion. We need it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.